On the outside kick, I've got a different, slightly different preset. Kick out, boom. I'm using a different compression e entirely. And I've also got the same EQ, but it's in a bypassed state. Uh, sometimes that, that outside kick uh, doesn't need much EQ. Uh, with the right microphone and the right placement, you might not need to EQ it at all. So uh, I'll, I'll have that SSL EQ load, but as you can see, it's bypassed. So you see there? So it's not active yet, it's, but it's open and ready to be activated with the click of a switch. I don't necessarily need to EQ it though. So the compression pops up. Um, I don't need to do too much with that outside kick usually. So I've just got a simple uh, a United Audio uh, 1176. This is a legacy version, which uses a little bit less of my uh, Apollo's uh, RAM. So uh, usually just dropping a little slight compression on that kick drum is all that I need. Uh, maybe a little bit of EQ if at all, but usually it's sounding pretty good. I'm not using very much of it either. I'm just using it to um, add some bottom end to that inside microphone. Going over to my snare, I've got a preset on that as well. There's my distressor, and again, I've got my SSL EQ ready to EQ that snare, but it's in a bypassed state. So if I don't need to EQ the snare, if I've got it sounding like I want it from the microphone, it doesn't need any EQ, I don't need to turn on an EQ. Uh, I think a lot of us have a habit of reaching for EQ, uh, even if it already sounds good, just to tweak it. You know, we all want to EQ everything, but sometimes don't reach for EQ. You know, just listen to it. Does it sound great in the mix? You don't need to EQ it, then don't EQ it. The same could be said for compressors. Uh, if it doesn't need compression, great, but snares usually do. They're a little bit lively as an instrument, so you want to tame that beast a little bit. Uh, here I've got the same distressor, but it's a different uh, settings that I do on my kick drum, and you can save those as part of that preset as, as well. That is, you dial in the tone you want on your snare, the ratio, the attack, the release, all that important stuff, and then save that on that channel so that when you load up that compressor on that snare, it's already been adjusted for snare drums. It's You can do that on every different, it's not just a flat a default setting on the distressor. Uh, you've adjusted it and made that for, for the way you like to adjust snares. Um, and it's saved every time. Then if you wanted to, you could you know open up your EQ and turn off the bypass and go to, go to town on that as well. Usually what I'll do on snare drum EQs is turn on the filter, the high pass filter. I'll kick, turn that on and then uh, roll the lows out of that by turning this up. You're coming from 20, 50, 70 hertz up to 120. Those, you know, all that stuff below 70 or 80 is not really snare drum stuff. It's probably your bass drum leaking into the snare drum microphone. So you can safely bring that high pass filter up. Now I've got it at 100, 150. So you're getting rid of all that low end on that snare drum and just bringing in the frequencies that you want out of that snare drum. You might not have to EQ anything else once you've adjusted that high pass filter and let all that weeded out all that low end stuff the snare sounds great you just have a lot of kick drum leaking into that mic so you can turn that filter on bring that up if you start getting up too high 200 300 you're starting to cut into the the, frequ the middle frequencies the lower and middle frequencies of that snare so don't don't go too high and then you'll just have the very high end of that snare but usually down here 70 80 even 100, 120, you can roll off a lot of low end out of that snare and get it sounding good. Uh, if you wanted to, you might add a little bit of high end, a little bit of crispness to the very top end, but check it first because you might be getting that on other microphones like the overheads. So if you don't need to add uh, brightness, uh, don't do it. Just just let the ring, the drum ring out naturally. Also, be careful of leakage, like from that hi hat. See if your hi hat is leaking into that snare as well, which it often does. Uh, if it is, be careful about adding high, high uh, end EQ because you're also bringing up that hi hat. So you're better off with a little, a little bit darker, uh, less bright snare than you are by letting too much hi hat in there. On my bottom snare, pretty simple. I've got a, the same SSL EQ bypassed and I'm using a stock 
uh, compressor that comes with the Mark of the Unicorn uh, digital performer. That's their Masterworks FET76 compressor. Uh, also a brilliant in, uh, compressor that's included. It's modeled after an 1176. As you can see, it looks a lot like an 1176. And it they spend a lot of time. Unlike Logic, uh, Mark of the Unicorn doesn't give you a whole bunch of different compressors. They give you two. They give you one that's like an 1176. The other one is more like an LA-2A. They don't call it a compressor for some reason. They call it a leveler. I wish they would just call it a compressor. Uh, so you get the, the FET 76, which is like an 1176, and you get this uh, nice looking uh, Masterworks leveler, which is more like an LA-2A, a little bit more uh, old school. And you've got some selections on the bottom here. So they're, they're two really nice compressors. I just don't like them as much as my Universal Audio. Uh, and I'm not a snob. I've really looked at using them without my Universal Audio stuff, but I, I do think that the Universal Audio compressors uh, sound better than the ones that are included. So you can play with them. Uh, in this case, I've got the 1176 on my bottom snare. It's not as critical to me. Uh, you could put an 1176 on that as well, but I, I usually just find that that bottom snare uh, needs a little bit of compression. I might turn off that bypass on that EQ, open that up, and again, use my filter to roll off. You can go a lot higher on that bottom snare because all you're trying to do is get the sound of that snare. You're not trying to get any crack or thud out of it. You just want the, the high-end brightness, the high mids of that, that snare. So you, you can usually roll off all that junk out of your bottom mic using just the uh, high-pass filter. If you wanted to, again, you could add some a little bit more brightness out of it using your high frequency EQ. But I find that usually there's plenty of it just as it is. One thing that I've been getting into a lot lately on my snare, and let me get rid of the two plugins that I have on there, is I've come back to round to using an old favorite uh, that I sort of stopped using for a while, and I don't know why. It's the API Vision channel strip. Let me open that up there. There she is. This is a great place to use this channel strip. It looks a bit complicated, more complicated than the uh, simple compression and EQ that I have, but it has a really nice noise gate uh, as well as some great EQ. I've, I'm finding that I can get a little bit more control over my snare drum and sometimes my kick drum as well by running these on the uh, turning off the uh, the presets that I just showed you and turning on one version of this on the on the uh, kick and on the snare, especially on the snare. And the main reason for that is the noise gate that the uh, the API has. The EQ is very nice too. I've got to say they've really got a, a beautiful EQ for snares. But being able to dial in that noise gate on the API uh, channel strip is really nice. That's a great way to clean up your snare. It's probably the best noise gate that I've worked with, and I've worked with a few. Uh, the API uh, noise gate is really very fast, and you can really adjust it, uh, uh, how, how long it stays on, how the depth of it, how low it goes, uh, how quickly it responds. Uh, there's a vintage setting as well as a uh, faster setting, fast or normal. Uh, it's got a uh, expander, if you want to get into expanders. Uh, it's got all kinds of little features on it, but that little section right there is a very powerful way to clean up your snare uh, and get rid of all those other drums that are getting into that snare so that you're just getting that pop, that snap, every time he cracks that snare without cutting off too much other stuff that you don't, you don't want. You don't want this snare gated sounding. Uh, this isn't 1987. So uh, down below it, you've also got a really nice compressor. Uh, this is a great compressor for snares. You just turn it on and adjust your threshold. Usually your ratio is already fine, right around three or four there. And then how, um, how quick the attack is. But I usually don't have to mess with that stuff too much. I'm usually able to find uh, the threshold right there. And again, you can adjust a fast or a medium, or even there's a middle position there, a slow uh, uh, attack on your uh, 
compressor right there. So those three settings there. Here's your VU. Then down below, there's a hard knee or a soft knee. And down below that, you've got the old uh, style uh, compression, or you can click it onto a, a less vintage and a more modern, newer style. Uh, API had two different iterations of that. One was the uh, older version, which sounds great. If you want something a little more aggressive, kick it up to the new setting there, and it's more of a more of a modern compression. Uh, so you've also got that high pass filter right here, uh, so you can just like on the SSL, you can roll out most of that junk in your snare drum that you don't need below a certain frequency, usually right in there. If you had a lot of hi-hat getting into that snare, you could also get rid of that here with the opposite, with the low pass, rolling off all of that hi-hat that's leaking in and just finding the frequency where that hi-hat starts to go away, leaving just the, the snare. I mentioned the EQ, and you've also, you can also drive the gain on it a little bit if you want to get a little bit more of that API sound from your snare, or you can basically reamp it here. You could also use this uh, when you're recording your snare, you know, this is a great plug-in to record your kick and snare with. Um, API's got some great sounding preamps. Uh, I find it's a little more quicker with the mixing board that I use, but if you don't have a, a console, the API uh, channel strip is a great plug-in. Uh, you could put this on, on all of your channels, not just drums, and probably get some really great mixes that way, but I, I'm an old school guy, I like using my mixing board. So and I'll, I'll apply these as plugins when I'm mixing down. Just to mention, this is the uh, Vision channel strip. This didn't used to be the legacy version. This used to be the only version. More recently, Uni Universal Audio has uh, updated that and they've got a more uh, modern version of it, which they've made some improvements to the preamp as well as the EQ. They've allowed you to click it over to a graphic style EQ. This is the 550. Uh, they give you their other, I think it's the 560, but I haven't updated yet. I find this really does the trick, but if you're if you're getting a new version, uh, go ahead and get the, the brand new Vision Channel Strip. And it also has a fader here instead of just this master output, so you get a little fader as well. So that's something I've been kind of using a lot on my kick and snare, especially. You could use it on tom-toms as well. Uh, for that matter, you could use it across all your drums, but I, I really just pop it on for the kick and snare, mostly. On my Tom Toms, let's take a look here and see what I'm looking at. I've got three different presets for three different Tom Toms because I treat each of them a little bit differently. The first Tom Tom, I've got a few things here. The first and most obvious, I've got two things bypassed. The, the first and most obvious is this compressor right here. Uh, I could use the 1176 or I could use the distressor. Uh, but uh, what I've kind of grown used to is using this. Uh, this is a nice little plug-in from Waves. This is the DBX160, which is a classic, uh, almost vintage compressor uh, that it sounds great on drums. It's very simple to operate. It doesn't require a lot of RAM, and it's pretty, pretty simple to set up. There's not a lot of settings on it. Basically, you adjust your threshold here. Uh, it'll show you a little blinking light if you're below, below or above that and then how much do you want it to compress. It's a lot like an 1176 in that respect. There's not a lot, not a lot of detailed changes you can make to it besides your output. It's a really nice sounding compressor on drums, I find. It's got a lot of great presets right there you can get to very easily. So that's a real simple kind of over easy compressor that I drop on my three Tom Toms. Then down below that I have if I need it, I've got my uh, SSL EQ again, and I've got it bypassed, but if I unbypass it, it's already got the filter turned on. It's already rolling off some of those lows that I might probably don't want. And I've also added a little bit of uh, some high frequencies here on the Tom Toms as well. So it's as easy as unbypassing it. I don't have to tweak those uh, EQ settings very much. Same with Tom Tom number two. Same plugins, just the EQ is going to be a little bit different, but I've got those on all three. You see, so I've got three different settings on three different Tom Toms. Again, it's really nice to have the stuff that you might not be using bypassed, just so when you turn it on, it doesn't automatically start sucking your RAM. 
So if you're not using it, bypass it. Um, if you are gonna use it every time, turn off the bypass so you don't have to turn that bypass off every time you load the plugin. It's, it's ready to go and it's actually working as soon as you open it up. And even before you open it up to look at it, it's already compressing. Over to the hi-hat, let's take a look and see what I've got there. On the hi-hat, pretty simple. I've got another DBX compressor and some EQ. You can see on this one, when I unbypass it, I've got the high pass filter cranked way up, almost to 200 there. And that's all it's doing. It's rolling off all the low end on that hi-hat. So none of those other drums are getting into that mic or at least they're being filtered out. That's the only thing I'm doing with that hi-hat. I'm not adding more high-end or anything like that. I'm just rolling off those lows. So that high-pass filter is your, your good friend there, guys. Over here on the ride, guessing probably sort of the same thing. Let me take a look. Oh, no, it's a little bit different. No, it's, it's pretty much the same. I've got the DBX compressor, uh, SSLEQ, same kind of stuff. Looks like a, almost a copy of the hi-hat EQ for that ride. That's the spot mic on the ride, by the way. Uh, on the drum talkback, here's a little secret. On the drum talkback, I've got my Empirical Lab Distressor. And I've got it set on the Nuke setting, which is a very extreme over 20 to 1 ratio. It's the most extreme ratio that they have, and it works really well on drum room overheads. Drum room mics sound really good when you slam them with either a 20 to one or a nuke setting. You're really crushing the heck out of them, and you're keeping anything from going over a certain certain level. Uh, it's, it's a really fun setting, and it just squashes everything down, and you can bring up that level and get a lot of uh, energy out of that talkback microphone that uh, the drummer probably didn't use during the take. He's not talking to me during the drum take, so I'm able to use that as a room mic. Even just in small doses, bringing up a little bit of that highly squashed uh, uh, talkback mic can add a nice gutsy punk edge to it sound make it sounds a little more like it was recorded in a garage so if you're looking for a, you know if your mix is sounding a little bit too pristine and produced and clean uh bring up a little bit of that room mic with some compression on it and it'll add a grunginess to the to the song that sometimes sounds good if you want a clean polished sound keep it off you bring up a little bit of it uh you're adding some some nice uh, energy if you bring it up a lot it's going to kind of undo everything else that you've been doing to clean it up. All those tom-toms and cymbals are going to be getting into your, your mix again. But a little goes a long way. Uh, another great use for that distressor. You don't have to use the nuke setting. You can, you're fine with other ratios, but I just I just crank it up all the way. And you can even play with your, um, your harmonic distortions if you wanted to add some tube distortion to it or even kind of a tape saturation sound to it. That's what that audio button is for right there. It's also nice because you, unlike the hardware device, you've got a, a mix setting, so you can sort of do a parallel uh, compression. If you don't want quite so much of it, you can use this. But again, you're using this to blend it in to an existing uh, drum kit, so that's kind of the same thing right there. Uh, but you can, you can do that here if you want as well, and leave that up at zero, leave that up all the way, and then determine how much of that compression sound you want right there. Also, I've attached just a little uh, uh, EQ to that as well, so you can EQ that signal if you need. After that, we're getting over to my overheads, uh, and let me pop these up. On the two mono tracks, the left, right overhead mic, um, I've just got, I don't have any compression on this one. All I've got is my EQ so that I can, uh, again, roll off uh, or high pass my Symbols, so I can get rid of all the kicks and drums and tom-toms and just let those cymbals ringing out. I just want the cymbals in my overheads. I don't want to try to get room sound up into there. So by using that high-pass filter, you can get rid of all that low-end rumble and just treat your, your cymbals separately. You can add a little bit of brightness up here if you want uh, to the top end, a little air. On the, the, but probably don't need it. Cymbals are pretty bright without adding too much EQ. Um, the reason I don't have a compressor 
on these overheads is not because I'm not going to use a compressor. I'm going to use a great compressor, but I'm not going to use it uh, on each of these mono channels. What I'll do is once I'm done tracking, I'll send those two channels over onto one stereo bus. Here I go. I keep them all over on my far right hand side of my mixer and then I just drag them over as I need. This takes a second. And I'll bring that stereo bus and park it right next to my overheads. I kind of keep it down to the right hand side of the channel so I'm not looking at that during my tracking section. I, li I like to keep things kind of concise when I'm tracking, but you could you could leave it next to these guys if you wanted to all the time. But anyway, there's my stereo bus and I just reassign these from individual mono outputs to my mixing board. I assign them to a stereo pair, which I call overheads or O's. And then I've got a stereo pair, stereo fader that controls both of those mono faders. So I can make little adjustments left and right like I showed you earlier and then treat the stereo group as one fader. So I can bring that those stereo, those two stereo mics way down in my mix or bring them up. I can really fine tune them there. The nicest thing about having control over it like that, besides the fader, is that you can now attach or apply a compressor to that stereo pair. And I'll bet you know what I'm gonna do here, don't you? Here's my favorite plugin for drum overheads is the API 2500 bus compressor. Uh, it's beautiful on uh, drum buses and uh, not just overheads, but you can use this. This is a beautiful bus compressor that I picked up, again, from Universal Audio. Uh, it comes with a package. You can get the uh, API 2500 as well as the uh, a couple of their EQs. They've got a really nice package that includes all of the API, API stuff. I highly recommend getting it, uh, if not for just the price of this particular compressor. I always wanted one of these in my uh, hardware rack, but they're a little bit pricey, so I'm now I'm really happy to have the plug-in version uh, as a stereo bus compression, and I use it all the time on my overheads. I'll also use it as a drum bus. I'll send all of my drums, once I've got them tweaked and mixed like I want, I'll send them all to one stereo drum bus, and then put an API compressor on top of that. You could put other compressors too on it, but I really like this one for drums and especially cymbals. I won't go too much into the settings of this, but it's got a lot of cool stuff. Uh, the types of knees you can use, old versus new. Uh, it's got a lot of, these, these little guys will determine how much low end gets or doesn't get to the compression. So you can leave all your bottom end, your kick and your heavy stuff down there while compressing the top end, compressing the cymbals without really affecting the low end too much. Uh, it's a brilliant compressor. Also, it has a nice little mix setting here if you wanna do a parallel compression. That's something that the hardware device does not have, so. But usually I'll leave that at 100 and just uh, put my cymbals on a stereo pair, put them through this, and I can adjust that. You can put it in manual output if you want to adjust it right there, but I usually leave it in uh, auto makeup gain. So when you compress something heavily, it's automatically raising the output to compensate. I won't go too much into the link, that's kind of a little more complicated. Uh, so, but yeah, definitely read the manual on this and pick up this compressor, uh, one of my favorites. And you're going to love the way your cymbals sound through that. You can squish the heck out of them if you really want to squash your cymbals, or you can leave it kind of just kissing the top end just to bring the, the volumes down, the peaks a little bit. Like right now, all of the different drum outputs have an individual output going back over to my mixing console for tracking. So when I'm Working with the band, I can do all my work over on the mixing console. It's a little bit more fast and intuitive on a mixer, and I'm not messing around in here with the DAW uh, until I'm ready to edit and mix down. So I'm keeping everything out in the analog world where I can get my hands on it quickly uh, and adjust over there. And then when I'm ready to mix and everybody's done tracking, I start pulling things away from the mixer and put them in my box where I can start automating and uh, getting total recall. That's the difference between uh, working on the console and working in the DAW. The console is a little bit more intuitive. You can move your hands around a lot more quickly and deal with several problems at the same time with several different musicians. Uh, and it's a little more intuitive, but you can't recall sessions. So if the band comes back uh, you know, a week later and wants to do a remix or make some adjustments, uh, you can't do that with an analog console. That's where the the, uh, the DAW comes in so handy because if you, once you start making moves and 
recording plugins and whatnot in the DAW, it's going to come back exactly the same as when you last worked on it. So that's kind of that's kind of the way I work. It's a hybrid way of working where you know we're working on the console and you don't have to wait till the very end. You can start putting things and making adjustments and applying plugins as you go along. So when I'm done with the drums, I'll start putting some plugins on it, maybe drop that API compression on there, EQs and whatnot. So, uh, and then when the, when the bass player's got his parts done, I'll go ahead and, and put my settings on the bass and start, but I don't really start mixing everything until the whole project is done. I do all my rough mixes and everything out on the console. 